I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. And yes, I turn ditch wood. <laughs> not only do I turn ditch wood, I'm happy to turn ditch wood. Why? Well, not only am I helping the homeowner or the property owner get rid of some wood that they're trying to dispose of, I'm recycling and repurposing these pieces of wood into beautiful wood bowls. And what could be better than that? Now, most of this wood on the side of the road it gets used for firewood and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's also nothing wrong with picking up some of it and trying it on the lathe and seeing how it turns. This is also a great way to learn different tree species and how they handle with the bull gouge and on the lathe. So if you get an opportunity to find some wood that's lying on the side of the road, I would highly recommend not passing it up. Now, not only am I going to turn ditch wood today, but I'm going to turn an ingrain bowl. Now, I've had many requests for an ingrain turning, and today you guys are going to get an ingrain turning. Now, I have to warn you, this is by all means almost exactly opposite of all of the other turnings that I typically do. Normally, I'm turning side grain or cross grain bowl planks, and that's where the ingrain is on two ends and the side grains on opposite the 90 degrees from those end grain. So I'm cutting in grain and side grain, in grain and side grain. With an in grain piece like this, the grain will be oriented from the headstock to the tail stock. So we're going to have all of our orientations. The grain cutting orientation will be opposite of a side grain bowl. I'll actually have tools that I'll be using that do not get used on a side grain mounted bull. And we'll talk about that more as we get into this. So I'm excited to share this with you guys. So sit back and let's check out this ingrain bull turning. Okay, so I wanna center up this bull blank and unlike the side grain mounted bull blanks, I'm going to line up with the pith. This log looks almost centered. It has a little more weight to the top side here a little bit, about an inch thicker on one side than the other, but it's pretty much centered, which is great. So I'm gonna go ahead and center the pith because I want the pith to be centered in the bottom of the bowl when I'm done, instead of being just slightly off center. So with the faceplate mounted, I'm going to mount the blank to the lathe. And remember to hold on to the blank and turn the hand wheel. Do not try to turn the blank onto the spindle headstock because you have run the risk of damaging the threads on the headstock. And whenever you get an opportunity, always pull that tailstock up for added support. It's just going to make it more secure and easier to turn a little bit more aggressively. You don't have to worry about dislodging the blank on the lathe. There you can see the wobbliness of the bowl blank, that one inch difference is pretty substantial when we get the speed up. So I'm not going to be able to get the speed up very high initially. I'm going to have to keep this relatively slow until I get this rounded off. Now what I'm going to be using is the spindle roughing gouge. The spindle roughing gouge is designed to make peeling cuts. What's a peeling cut? Well, this is what I'm doing right now and it's not a really good example yet because we have that off balance piece. I'm just hitting the high spot and it's kind of bouncing around here. But a peeling cut essentially is the material comes by the roughing gouge and gets peeled away. You can kind of see that here with the little chips and that's just the high spot that's, that's hitting. Unfortunately because we hold it in about a 45 degree angle it's it's a little more difficult than the bull gouge to put downward pressure on the tool rest. So that bouncing action that I'm getting right now, what I really need to be doing is putting more pressure down into the tool rest. However, because I'm at a 45 degree angle, even when I do apply pressure into the tool rest, it's still wanting to bounce when that high spot comes around. There's the high spot and there's the low spot, it still has bark on it. And I needed to remove some of that material so I can get the banjo underneath the bowl blank as well. So. With an ingrain turning, what I'm doing is I'm working this outside edge and I kind of want to work in a line until I get everything balanced out. In other words, I'm not going to curve in and start shaping the bowl just yet. I want to, I want to balance this out, start knocking down some of those high spots. And as I knock those down, I can speed this up a little bit. Here you can see this bark is loose. Whenever you get a chance to take off any loose bark, you want to do that because it's going to come off. 
and a piece that large that loose it would probably come off all in one section and it doesn't feel too good bouncing off your face or your body trust me I've had it happen many times okay so here you can see I'm actually curving the bottom of the bowl blank here this is going to be the bottom of the bowl so I'm going to go ahead and kind of start curving it and because I'm making a continuous cut there and I'm beyond that high and low spot you can see it's actually starting to make a nice peeling cut in that area it is literally just peeling away the wood fibers right off of that log and because we have the ingrain orientation of this bull blank those peels can be very long You're, we're basically just unraveling the layers of the log itself and this is exactly how plywood is made it's peeled away in big sections and then there those sections are glued together to make plywood again we still have a lot of rough spots here and some high areas that need to be dealt with so the spindle detail gouge or i'm sorry the spindle roughing gouge has about a 45 degree bevel on it and we want that tool to be held at about a 45 degree angle so what's happening is the material just comes across the top of that roughing gouge and gets sliced right across it now we're also tilting the gouge at about a 20 degree angle and it varies you can tilt it at different degrees in the direction of the cut here you can see i've got it tilted to the right as i'm making a left to right cut now that this blank is becoming more round i'm going to be able to speed it up just a bit so i'm going to bring the lathe speed up what i'm looking for here is any kind of vibration or wobble that starts to occur and i don't, obviously don't want that to happen so i'm able to get the speed up pretty significant here and it's going to make the cut just a little bit easier now we're starting to see the peeling cut the way it should appear just a nice smooth continuous path i still have some high and low spots so it's not making a really smooth cut at the moment now the grain orientation with an ingrain mounted bowl blank is really critical to have supported grain we're going to be always wanting to move from the shorter grain to longer grain so we want long grain to be under the grain that we're cutting now i have a video that explains this in great detail and it's kind of complicated and until you get it it's can be very confusing but with the ingrain mounted bowl plank we're essentially going from the side of the bowl down to the rim and now this is the exactly opposite of a side grain mounted bowl plank where we usually go from the rim up to the side of the bowl now you can start to see some of those peeling cuts those long shavings coming off there they are long thin paper like shaving is coming off that that's a good indication you're getting a really nice peeling cut from an ingrain turning now why do the side grain mounted bull blanks have shorter curly shavings you might be asking well the reason for that is is that each time the side grain mounted bull blank goes around it meets the ingrain sections twice once on each side of the bull blank and the ingrain is perpendicular to the cut so the curled or the shavings get ended at the ingrain they come to an end so essentially the curled shavings from a side grain mounted bull blank are one slice from each side of the side of the bowl and it ends at the end grain so there's a start and an end to those curled shavings with an ingrain piece like this when we make a peeling cut if we do it right we could probably slow this down and do more of like a shave from it we could actually shave away a very long ribbon of shaving essentially it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a curled shaving it would just be a long continuous shaving because we're basically peeling away that those fibers from the side of the bowl here i'm forming the tenon and the shoulder for this bowl now this is very important 
With a side grain bowl blank, you have the option to make a tenon or a mortise or a recessed area, depending on how you want your bowl to look in the design. With a side grain mounted bowl blank, you do not have the option to do a mortise or a recessed area. Yeah, you could try it, but what happens is because all those ingrain fibers are coming together, if you try to expand them with a recess or a mortise, you're going to push them open and you're going to have no support. Instead, the tenon will allow the four jaw chuck to grip and grasp those ends of the end grain very firmly and give you very, very good control once we flip this around. So you really don't want to use mortise or a recessed area on an end grain turning. And again, I, I hate making definites like that when it comes to turning because yeah, I know there's opportunities that you can make that happen. And, and if it works for you in your particular situation, do it. But most of the times it with an end grain turning, you really want to use a tenon because it's going to give you more gripping power on that blank. So I'm using a bowl gouge now to start shaping the shape of this bowl. And as I'm shaping this, I'm cutting across those fibers and I'm not peeling them away the like the roughing gouge did. And the roughing gouge actually is a little bit better for this, but I'm a little bit more comfortable using the bowl gouge. So I'm using the tool that I'm comfortable with and that's the bowl gouge. But what's happening is instead of making long peeling cuts, it's slicing through the tips of the, those ingrains. So I'm getting a lot of dust. And this wood is very wet, so it's very sticky, sticky small particles of pine. What's nice about this pine, even though it's really wet, it's not very sappy. This was cut in the spring. Typically the pine trees or the coniferous trees will create a lot of sap in the fall and winter so that they can get through the winter. But in the spring, it's not so bad. They're more watery than they are sappy. <laughs> Losing a little visibility here because of those small particles. Okay, so I'm starting to get the shape of the bowl. I'm really happy with this. And I'm just gonna fine tune this a bit. So we're going to make very light cuts here. If you watch that top edge, you can see the shape changing. And I'm going with the supported grain. Now remember, this is a side grain bowl. So I'm going to go from the high point down to the base of the, the bowl. And that is a supported cut for an in grain turning. Now if I had made that cut on a side grain bowl, I would have just torn out all of the in grain fibers and been left with a rough surface. But here on, with an ingrain turning, that's the direction you want for a smooth cut. Just going to take your time to make some, some nice smooth transitional cuts here to get the curve the way you want it. Now I'm looking at this shape and I'm realizing that I don't want the rim to be as high as I've got it located right now. So I'm just going to make some quick roughing cuts to locate where that rim will be. And I'm going to put the rim right about here. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen. It would help me out. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so the exterior of the bowl is formed. So I'm gonna take this off the lathe and remove the face plate. Again, hold that blank and turn the hand wheel so that you don't damage the threads on your headstock. This is an impact driver, by the way, and it does a great job getting the screws in and out of the wet wood. Regular drill doesn't doesn't work as well and then it gets bound up and you start stripping the heads of the screws and that but an impact driver does a great job. I'll have a link to that and all the tools I use in this video down in the description below this video if you want to check those out. 
Okay, so I'm gonna reverse this and mount it into the four jawed chuck. And as you can imagine right there, that chuck is gripping those end grain fibers very firmly. Again, I'm gonna pull the tail stock up. It's turning pretty true, but it's, it's gonna to need to be cleaned up just a little bit. And to do that, I really wanna sharpen my tools. So I'm gonna take my half inch bowl gouge. This is a 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. And I'm gonna bring it over to the sharpening station and get that sharpened up. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make some light cuts, but I'm also gonna make some shear scraping cuts to smooth out this surface. Because it's not turning quite true, I wanna take a little bit of time here to knock down the high spots. And because these are refining finishing cuts, we want to go nice and slow and make very thin passes. Now right there, I kind of lost the cut. And if you watch what I'm doing here, I'll pull the bowl gouge back and just let the bevel edge ride until I feel that edge where I left off. And then I can return to the cut. Then we can turn the gouge around and do some shear scraping. This is just a a light shaving cut that occurs and it'll smooth out those those rough spots. You'll know you're doing the shear scrape well when you have nice thin shavings coming off like you see to the left there. And because it's such a light shaving cut you can move in both directions, both with the supported and unsupported grain direction. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy with the exterior of the bowl. I need to get some of this interior cleared away. So I'm going to just quickly move across and, and cut some of that out. Now, the tailstock here is really valuable because it's helping add additional support. I'm adding a very hard 90 degree angle force against this the chuck or the tenon of this bull blank. Without that tailstock, that tenon is gonna be taking a lot of pressure at this moment because I'm pushing hard against that. But while I have the opportunity, I'm gonna leave that tailstock there so it takes up some of that burden and doesn't damage the tenon. So I'm gonna take this down to where I want the rim level to be. I'm gonna shape the rim and I'm gonna take out even some more material from the center of the bull while I have the tailstock support. And then I'll take this, that section in the center away. Okay, I'm gonna shape my rim here. Now, the rim, I wanna just take my time and make a light pass. And I'm only using a little bit of the bowl gouge as you see here. And as I'm doing that, I'm making just a really nice clean cut across there. So I'm gonna be left with a really nice smooth edge. Now, this is kind of interesting. So at the same time, I'm gonna change now in the same pass, and I'm gonna make a quicker, more aggressive roughing cut. And I wanna show you guys what the difference of those two cuts were. There's the edge. Look how clean the ingrain fibers are right there along the edge and the rim. Now look at the center. See that torn out section? Well, those torn out fibers go deep down into the wood. A lot of times we think, well, if we got ingrain tear out, we could just sand that. Well, you can, but you're going to sand for a very long time because those ingrain pits that you saw there run very deep down into the wood. Sometimes a quarter or, or an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch down into the wood, many millimeters down into the wood. Okay, so I'm just going to turn this off. Now remember, the tail stock is not supporting this bull blank. It's not, in other words, it's not pinned in there like a spindle turning might be. It's supported by the chuck on the other end. So I'm just gonna turn away this section and now the tailstock's job is done from this side of the blank. Using my spindle gouge, I'm going to make a just a small little clean recessed or a concave cone in the center here. 
and that's going to be a guide for the drill bit that we're going to use to hollow out the center. Now, unlike a side grain bowl blank, the interior of an in grain bowl needs to be turned from the center up to the rim. Yeah, so we've got to start in the middle and work up to the rim. So what I'm doing here is I'm determining the depth of how deep I want to go inside this bowl. This is an auger, a hand auger. It's just used to bore a hole right down the center of the bowl. And that's going to give me a starting point for the tool to enter and then work out to the top rim. I've marked it with tape here just so I, I know, but I also need to remember that that tape is indicating visually where the top edge of the rim is. The material in the center of this bowl has been cleared a little bit deeper than that, so I've got to make sure I'm lining that markup with the edge of the rim of the bowl. Now, what I've got here is a hook tool. Michael Hoslick makes this hook tool, and there are several companies that make different hook tools. This is a hook tool that Michael Hoslick makes. And what it does is it allows us to get in and do an ingrain interior cut. It's essentially a bull gouge on a stick, if you can think of it that way. You can see the curly shavings that I'm getting in there. I'm working from the middle up to the rim, and I'm using the side of this hook to get in there and create the, the cut. And by doing this, we're cutting versus scraping. And this is going to give us a really nice clean surface as we work along. So if we think about it, to have a cut edge in there, if we were to use a bowl gouge and actually be on the bevel, the gouge itself would be, have to be positioned back inside the bowl and be somehow introduced through the sidewall of the bowl. Well, obviously that's physically impossible. So that's why we're using this hook. The hook and the little small narrow tip of that can get in there and get on the, on the bevel and create a nice cut versus a scrape. Now, I started this area and it's cutting very well. You can see there that the ingrain fibers are cut super well. And I've got to tell you, I don't use this tool a lot. And it's one of those things where obviously you want to use it and get used to it. So it's starting to get a little bit tricky here. So I, what I'm doing is I'm looking at potentially a better way to hog out material to get the bulk of this material out. And then I can return to this tool. So I started looking at the half inch bull gouge. And I can make a scraping cut with that and just push it up against the grains. And that works to a degree. It's going to get a little dangerous as I stick it down deeper into the bowl, but it does work to scrape away some material. It's not going to give me a clean cut by any means. And we want to start from the bottom out again, because that's the supported grain direction for the ingrain bowl blank. Matter of fact, if I make a push cut here, like we typically do with a side grain bowl, I'll show you what the results are. We're going against the grain here, so I'm tearing out ingrain fibers. You do not want to do this with an ingrain bowl. I want you to see this. Now look at those ingrain fibers. They're just a big mess. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this scraping tool. This is a Hunter Tools scraper. And it's actually really good at hogging out material. I usually use this when I'm doing a hollow form. And I just need to remove the bulk of material inside the bowl itself. Now this is not going to give me the opportunity to make a really smooth guided cut. And I'm not really even concerned with that. I'm, I'm actually moving against the grain of the fibers right now. So I'm tearing this out. Again, I'm just using this to rough or hog out material. I want to get down to the final wall thickness and determine what that's going to be and then work my way down into the bowl. So you're basically presenting the scraper at the center line of the bowl, keeping it horizontal. 
And the motion of your body and the tool is going to dictate the shape of the path inside the bowl. There's no bevel and there's no guidance from anything other than your body control of how well that cut's going to be. That's one of the big advantages of a bowl gouge with the bevel. The bevel acts as a guide and makes a smooth, continuous cut for you. Scrapers do not allow that to happen. I have a video all about scrapers and bull gouges. If you want to check that out, you might be interested. Some good information there about the differences between the two. They both have advantages and they both have disadvantages in different situations. And in this particular instant, the scraper is a great way to get material out of the way. Now, I'm going to be using a round nose scraper here just to kind of smooth out those areas. Like I was saying, the the scraper that I was using doesn't give me the opportunity for a really smooth surface, but a big, wide, round nose scraper will help smooth out those edges. And like my other turnings you see, I, I typically like to determine the wall thickness up at the rim, finish that area, and then work down into the bowl. I don't return back up to that rim often, just in case there's an movement or vibration, I don't want to cause any problems. Now this isn't a very thin bowl, so it's not going to be a huge issue, but it's a good practice not to return to that rim. So with the rim sidewall established, now I'm going to clean out down to the base of this using the hook tool. I'm having a little bit of trouble with some of those edges created from the scraper, because it don't want it wants to start cutting and then pop out of the cut. Once it's leveled off, the hook tool makes a, a really nice pass all the way across. Now look at this. This is how a bull gouge might be presented in the same position. But because of the shape and the size of this bull, it's impossible to get a bull gouge deep inside that bull without interfering with the sidewalls. So here you can see I'm making a light cut and I'm, I'm going to feather that and merge it into the rim or the side of the bowl that's already been finished. And with the nice smooth cut across the bottom, those ingrain fibers are going to be cut smoothly versus being ripped out or scraped out, which we really don't want because that'll, that'll create that tear out that's not very desirable. You can just take your time, and just like the bull gouge, you want to make lighter cuts when you get closer to the last finishing passes. Now, there are lots of different hook tools on the market out there. This isn't the only one that's out there. You can do some exploration if this is something that you're interested in doing as far as ingrain turnings. It's interesting because the ingrain bowls have the grain of the tree stacked up from top to bottom. So you don't see too much interesting grain patterns on the exterior of the bowl, but the interior of the bowl is really dramatic because we're looking right down into the heart of the tree. And you get all those concentric circles of the grain of the tree. The other issue I was having here too, because I'm using these kind of salt, taller vertical sidewalls, is those grain layers have different thicknesses on the sidewall, and they're it's kind of hard to explain, but they're there in sections, so they kind of peel away really easily. So it's hard to get a really smooth surface on a vertical wall inside the bowl because of the way the ingrains are oriented. So I'm going to go back in with the round nose scraper and just ease the transition between those surfaces. I don't want to get down too far deep into the bowl where I was just making the nice cutting pass, but I just want to smooth out any of the rough spots. There you can see some of that side grain 
that I was mentioning to you that doesn't want to cut very evenly because it's it's like peeled layers on the sides, the vertical sides. Okay, so let's go ahead and pop this off the lathe and we're going to reverse it to shape the foot of the bowl. I'm using a fat, <laughs> I'm using a flat jam chuck here with a piece of carpet foam on it. It's going to be used to pad and secure the bowl when I mount it to the lathe. Now we want to use the little indentation from the tailstock earlier that's on the bottom of the tenon to center it, but inevitably it won't turn completely true initially. So what you can do is just lightly put the tailstock in place and then find the high spots. I use my thumb, find the high spot, and just give it a little tap and then put your thumb back there and check again and see if everything is turning smoothly. And as soon as it's turning nice and smoothly without any major offset, then you can tighten up the tailstock. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the foot area of the bowl. This is where if you give yourself a little bit extra space with a shoulder, you'll have a lot more options when it comes to creating the foot of the bowl. And one of the reasons I love doing tenons and tenons with shoulders is that I can I can make the foot any way I want on the bottom of that bowl. I can do all sorts of different things after the fact. With a recess or a mortise, which you again you don't want to do with an ingrain turning like this, but on a side grain turning with a recess or a mortise, it's a little more difficult to create a foot or create something that you, that you want on the base of the bowl other than just a small indentation from the, the recess. So I'm going to set the height of the foot here and start removing some of the material. Now I can't leave that foot as a big section. This wood is very wet and if we think of the foot of the bowl right there, which is about three quarters of an inch or maybe two centimeters, I still have the thickness of the bowl in there too, the bottom of the bowl. So that bottom area is going to be thick. And if you have a thick area and you have relatively thinner walls and the wood is wet, they're going to dry unevenly. And that's usually a good recipe for creating a crack. So we want to create even wall thicknesses and even material throughout. So I'm going to hollow out this foot. So it is also thinner and, and similar in thickness as the rest of the bowl. Before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and sand this a little bit. I had some ingrain fibers on the end of this bowl that were torn out just a bit. Not really torn out, they were just kind of fibrous. Almost, they're going to act like little wicks and they're going to create quicker evaporation down on those end grain fibers and I really don't want that to happen because if that again if anything dries unevenly with green wood that's when you're going to have cracking so everything you can do to balance out the bowl to make it dry evenly the better all right so I'm going to go back to the scraper and I'm going to scrape out and hollow out the bottom of this foot area and again, the, the two reasons I'm doing this, aesthetically, it looks a little bit more pleasing to the eye. But from a practical standpoint, I'm thinning that material so I'm not left with a big, thick mass of wood in the bottom of this bowl that's going to be subject to easy cracking. Now, I need to be careful here because this material is being supported by the tailstock now. There is no chuck or no gripping action occurring at the headstock. So the fact that this piece is pinned in place is the only thing holding it on. If I break this connection, this bowl is going to go flying. So I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to get in there with my spindle detail gouge. And I'm going to narrow this down as much as I can. I'm, I'm looking for it to start acting a little peculiar. Usually it'll kind of wobble or start showing me that it's losing some structural integrity. But so far, so good. So I'm going to thin it just a little bit more. I'm 
make a pushing cut across there. It gives me a nice clean cut across those end grain fibers using the spindle detail gouge. And then what you can do is you can push into that and then turn the lathe off. So I'm going to go ahead and make it just a little bit narrower. And now we can push into it, turn the lathe off, and turn it by hand. Sometimes it, it broke it free there, but it didn't quite cut through. So we'll need to cut those fibers off. It's not a big deal. So you can just use a, a knife. This is a little carving knife. And just cut through those end grain fibers. Now you don't want to do it really quickly because you're going to tear out end grain. And that's what we've been trying to avoid this whole time. So just take your time. And cut through and rotate it around and cut through. Don't cut through in one direction because you'll be left with a, a stump there. All right, so I'm going to let that dry and we're going to be able to sand this, but it really needs to dry before I can sand this and finish it completely. So there's the bowl. See what I was saying about the outside grain? It's, it's pretty interesting, but it's that inside grain and the concentric rings. It's really dramatic and really interesting to see. Look at those grains. All right, guys, there you have it. An ingrain turned piece of ditch wood. I think this turned out pretty nice overall. It's a pretty cool form. We've got totally different grain orientation and, and appearance on the outside and on the inside compared to a side grain mounted bull. We get these really cool concentric rings in the center of the bull on the ingrain piece like this. But we gotta remember that ingrain also has the pith in the center of it. Now, hopefully all of this piece will dry evenly and contract evenly so that pith doesn't dry out and crack. Pits are notorious for cracking and, and that. So we may have to put some epoxy in there. Either way, I'm going to let this dry completely and then I'm going to finish it, sand it down really good and then apply some finish to it. If I need to fill that pith area, then I'll do that. But all in all, I'm pretty pleased with the results. Now, I hope you've learned a whole bunch of new techniques to apply towards an ingrain turning. Now, remember, the techniques you saw here are not to be used on a side grain mounted bowl blank. That's what you, most of my other videos are, are side grain to, grained or cross grain mounted bowl blanks. Ingrain bowl blanks are a little bit different and we've used a lot of tools here that you do not want to use when you're turning a side grain mounted bowl. For instance, the spindle roughing gouge, absolutely never use that when you're turning a side grain mounted bowl. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you have, do me a huge favor and click that like button. Subscribe if you're not already subscribing and check out my website. If you're interested in turning wood bulls, if you're curious about it, or if you've been turning for a long time, you're going to want to check out my website. It's turnawoodbull.com. Yep, it's that simple. Turnawoodbull.com. So go over there and check out my website. You're not going to want to miss it. There's just a ton of information there. Thank you so much for watching this video and as always, happy turning.